right, so to our panel, um, really quickly, um, I am passionate about this topic because um, I've been doing, we've all been doing marketing for years, and there is a big gap between having an idea and actually getting that idea done. Um, and I think increasingly getting stuff done is becoming more and more complicated. Um, I actually teach a class on this at SMU. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, some of my students, I think, are here. Uh, we have a great panel to talk about this, and there's a rumor that one of the panelists is a former board member of the AMA. I've heard a rumor. So, look, if you volunteer, you can eventually come up here. So, with that, I'll let Leonard, our illustrious moderator, take over, and uh, we're looking forward to it. So, let's get started. Thank you, Brad. Thank you all for having us today. We're all very excited to be uh, part of this today. Our goal today is, as Brad said, um, it's not about having a great idea and it's executing. And so um, to that point, you know, ideas are easy and uh, implementation is hard. So we're going to talk about implementation around some of the concepts of meeting budgets, managing stakeholders, wrangling vendors, managing your team, having great meetings. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our panel in no particular order. Um, John Watts is with Lithia. Hope Elston is with Mary Kay. Eric Thurston is with Signify Health. Jeannie Golem is with Daisy Brand. And Marta Velasco is with Solus Mammography. All right, so the first question, and I'm just gonna throw it out to everybody. Marketing and digital marketing specifically seems to be getting more complex, especially with implementations such as new platforms, more APIs, more data, more fragmentation, et cetera. So what part of the process do you find the most difficult to manage? Planning, design, implementation, optimization, or reporting, and why? And I'll let whoever wants to start kick it off. Okay, I will go first. So Jenny Gollum, I'm from Daisy Brand, recent uh, CMO there. Uh, they make sour cream and cottage cheese, so family-owned uh, consumer packaged goods company, just for some reference. So for me, the most challenging part is the reporting afterwards. And we were talking about this a little bit before the panel started, and with the amount of fraud that's happening right now in the digital space to understand you know, are your views, click-throughs, all of these, are they real? Are they connected back to your actual consumer? And can you track not just A-B testing, but actual sales going back to driving your business, driving results? The whole reason we do digital marketing in the first place, can you track that? And because of the problem with fraud and because of the problem with just making that connection from the online world to the offline world in my case uh, is really challenging. Okay, thank you. Eric? Hello, oh it is on. <laughs> I'm Eric Thurston. I'm with Signify Health. Um, I'm going to play off of what Jenny was talking about, you know, with reporting, particularly for B2B companies like mine, you know, KPIs for us at the end of the day are air cover digital advertising campaigns. Really, the result that we want is whether or not we got the contract signed. And so for us, you know, working with our sales team um, and trying to move the needle on that, it can be hard sometimes on the back end to show to management that what we've been doing has actually made an impact. You know, we've been running digital advertising campaigns for a month while we've been in an RFP process, and we've been trying to make sure that our brand is top of mind for all the individuals at the organizations that we're targeting. And so trying to, to loop that back into the amount of money that we've spent so that, you know, when we're going into the budget season for next year and we're trying to ask for more dollars and trying to, you know, show that the efforts that we've been putting forth are valuable to the organization, valuable to our sales team, that's probably the biggest, biggest challenge that we run into from a reporting perspective. I, I echo both of you. I think reporting is one of the the biggest challenge is not only because there, there's a lot of paradoxes that you have to sort of report, report on, but you also have to make sure that the organization is understanding why digital and the value that you're adding to the company through, through that channel mix and through the, the investments that are placed behind that. Um, 
But prior you know, to that is, I think it all lives within the fabric of the brand and the exploration of how the story is told through the different campaigns that are being ran. And if that creative expression is not uh, in harmony with the brand, in harmony with what you're trying to create, that emotional attachment to who you are, and then making sure that the CTA is extremely well designed um, to drive that conversion. That is where I think a lot of times um, when we're not intentional enough in that first phase of how the experience is delivered through the ad itself is where we fail. And so for me, that's a very important piece of what I put a lot of emphasis on way prior to the launch itself. And I will not launch if I do not feel comfortable with that expression of the brand and how that CTA is sort of claimed within the creative expression of it, so. Uh, kind of to speak to what you were saying, um, so for us, it, it, it's kind of the brand and then the creative. And so from a dealership perspective, we have tons of s stigmas with you know, buying a car. And so for us, it's, it's, you know, we have to build out the brand to change the consumer's attitude, but it's the creative essentially that's going to change their behavior. And so that's kind of where we have to separate, you know, what is the right message at the right time for that specific consumer based on where they are in the funnel. So it's utilizing a lot of the data and then making decisions driven by data. And so that's kind of the challenge that we find is, you know, is this good data? Is this the right message? And so that, that allows us to go into kind of these A-B test environments and testing what we think is going to happen and what the data says should happen. So that's kind of uh, one of the challenges that I find kind of getting everybody wrangled together to find that singular vision uh, for that. And I'm going to speak to implementation, but then also I'd like to speak to innovation. So around the implementation, we had some challenges. And over the last year, because not only did we have to come to it from the creative aspect, but we were really being pushed to come through, through with what are some of those new platforms that we can implement for our ladies, because we do have a volunteer sales force, and we constantly have to keep her digital image in mind, because she's out there promoting us, but also building her team. And so one of the things we did was we took our digital marketing team and we moved them into our IT team. Because coming from marketing, we would go to our IT team and say, we want this, we want that, we want this, this is what's happening next. And they would say, okay, that's nice, but we got a lot of stuff happening. So what we did was we made it their problem. <laughs> We've got a lot done this last year. <laughs> So that helped also in the area of innovation because we were being pushed. Our, our newest president, Nathan Moore, he's real big into disruption and innovation. So he came to us and said, what do we need to do to make Mary Kay innovative, to make our ladies' digital image the best out there in the direct selling market? And so we really were challenged to take a look at not what's happening today, but what's happening three to five years from now. And so we started putting together cases to take to our executive team and we heard no's at first. And we were kind of scratching our head on, well, we really want to move the needle in the digital marketing world. What do we do? And so our biggest learning was an old Mary Kay saying of, if you get a no, it just needs, means they need more information. So we went back to the books and said, okay, well, how do we package this up differently for them? And so we, would, we repackaged it, came up with a different approach, and we just continued to take it back until we were able to help define better the direction we need to head. And we also learned that it's okay to get in front of them also and say, well, what do you want? What do we need to be doing? And so it's really helped us to move the needle in that area. Great. Thank you. So as you're planning out a, a uh, digital strategy and you begin to execute, on average, how many separate companies, vendors, or agencies do you work with um, in one of these campaigns? From an automotive perspective, uh, we deal with internal uh, creatives. Um, we have a LAD, which is a Lithia advertising uh, department, so it's an internal agency that we have within our dealership, so we have that singular voice as a brand. Uh, but we could still recognize the individual stores and where they lie within their specific markets and you know, targeting their backyard with that specific message. Um, and so f for us, sorry. So how many different vendors and, and agencies do you work okay. with? Absolutely. So sorry about that, guys. A little nervous. Uh, so going back to the, the agencies we work with, we work with automotive-centric agencies who normally are managing our website, right? And so with the website and, and the conversions and all the call to actions and having the right color and, the, and you know, the right price and the right display, 
that's one aspect, but then creating the marketing outside of that and what we're trying to drive traffic to, you know, uh, obtain this specific deal, but then when they get to the website, the infrastructure's not there. So we're constantly working with our search teams. Uh, we're also working with our website providers who are usually automotive-centric, our internal Lithia automotive department, and then uh, from there, it's like so many moving parts to get that singular, you know, voice across, and then where everything looks the same and all the platforms align up to the singular message. So for us, that's kind of the, the biggest challenge in, in the automotive industry. For my team, uh, you know, the last couple of years, my company has grown so much. And initially, we only had two people on the marketing team when I started. So launching a digital campaign was a lot easier back then because there were only two people to have to deal with. <laughs> Um, now we have built out a product marketing team. So we have two product marketing managers. So, you know, they're running product marketing uh, campaigns, digital campaigns. And then we also are running account-based marketing campaigns for each of the target prospective accounts that we have and then each of our current client accounts that we're trying to re retain. So it ends up being a, a whole slew of people. And, and you know, I, I have to hand it to our uh, uh, ABM manager. She's a, a wizard with all this, trying to balance all the plates and all the people and trying to move things down the pipeline. Um, you know, we're working with an ABM agency. We typically have a freelance graphic designer who we're working with. You've got the product marketing team. You've got approvals that have to go through. It has to go through me for brand. They all hate me because um, <laughs> I say no to everything. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of people, but, you know, I think the important thing is just, you know, staying on task with all of that. And if you're not using a task management system, you need to be using one. Don't be managing everything through, you know, a Google Doc. We try to manage all of our high-level projects through, like, a, a Google spreadsheet, so kind of updates on, you know, key initiatives and things like that. But for day-to-day -day stuff where we're trying to, to move along a campaign, we have specific tasks, alerts for everybody. Everybody knows where they're supposed to be, when it's supposed to be done. And that's really the only way that you can keep everybody accountable and also to track how long it's taking and how much it's costing for every step of the way. Which one do you use? So for task management, we use Reich. Um, I can't say whether I love it or hate it. You know, it's kind of a necessary evil. Um, I've used, I think it's team, Teamworks, Team Lead. Um, I've had a couple of colleagues who have used Monday. It just kind of depends on, on what works great for your organization. Um, our tech team uses Trello, which is more of a project management tool. Um, and we've used Basecamp here and there also for, for managing projects. So I think for each one of us, the structure is very differently just because of how our business is, the, the, you know, our, the business and the industry that we're in. Um, so for... For Solus Mammography, I have a senior brand uh, director who's leading the brand strategy, which is obviously core to how we go to market on our digital strategy. Under that, we have our art director, and then we partner with a production company in LA, um, Island Creek Pictures, amazing production agency that really creates the assets for digital. For the most part, it's a social-driven campaign, and then those assets, when we launch our new website in um, August will be leveraged to humanize the experience of our website um, and really being an advocate of women, not just a functional site for scheduling mammograms, right? Um, and then I am very, um, very intentional in the agencies that I partner with, so I don't like a single agency that solves for all of my digital needs. Everybody's different in that form. I personally am um, very uh, thoughtful and I choose based on what they're best within the channel that I need to solve for. So I look at social very differently from an understanding of how that channel works. And to tell you the truth, I'm not an expert. I have my digital um, director that understands that space, Ellen Hoffman, who also is a, a board director here and uh, under her digital analyst. So really uh, very focused on the reporting of those campaigns and holding our agencies accountable and in ownership of how the campaigns are performing, thinking of how to leverage every single piece to that campaign. So I become extremely tedious when it comes to every, every campaign, every link, you know, the message, the, the structure, the testing, the CTAs. And, to me, I focus on two channels. We've got our social um, ads, and then we've got our Google AdWords. I don't do programmatic. It doesn't fit with, uh, 
it's a non-performing channel for me, so for solus mammography. And we go very deep into every single piece of what's making that campaign work. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that covers it. And really making sure that it fits within the overarching digital strategy that there's harmony and consistencies that fall into that. Well, it's really interesting because uh, I agree we all have different perspectives, but my structure is uh, not dissimilar to yours. So I have an internal person, a social media and digital coordinator who manages all of our agencies. And like you, we have multiple agencies. So I feel like it was in vogue a while back in marketing to try to consolidate agencies as much as possible or have like maybe one creative agency and one digital agency. And the fact remains, uh, there's so much fragmentation in what digital marketing means that it's very difficult to have one agency that can do all of those things really well. So we have specific agencies that do specific things. Obviously, we have our regular creative agency that is involved in many things. We have our media agency that's buying a lot of the media, and they'll connect us depending on what media we buy. We buy a ton of Pinterest, for instance. Well, we were working with the pin factory at Pinterest to put together some content for the new um, talking video pins, which are super cool, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're, it's really cool. It looks like two separate pins, but it's actually one thing. So you can have things walk from one pin to another, or the two pins interact in some way. And so as you're scrolling through, it's very disruptive and catching. So we did that for our Daisy Cottage Cheese Toddler campaign, uh, where we're trying to get moms to realize what a great first dairy food, cottage cheeses for her baby, high in calcium, high in protein, easy to eat, etc. And we have a baby that just crawls from one pin to another to get the cottage cheese. And if you think that's not going to catch your eyes, you're scrolling through Pinterest, you've never scrolled through Pinterest before. So, um, But the pin factory helped us with that. We also have Ignite, our social agency. And here's a great story about why you need multiple agencies. Ignite was um, our social agency and did an amazing job with community management, loved what they did for us. And they had such a horrible time scheduling our pr promoted posts and when we were supposed to push a post and not, and it was just not working. And so I pulled that from them and gave it to a different agency. And I didn't want to get rid of Ignite because they were amazing at community management. And we have another Another agency that is now amazing at pushing our posts and so you just need to find the strengths of each, each of these agencies we also have like you a production company called Tadware that creates a lot of our social content for us in Minnesota so we're up there on a monthly basis producing more content I feel like content is the name of the game for digital and then lastly as I mentioned other partners that we have so we partnered with greatest.com which is a lifestyle blog they produce content for us we um, partnered with great American country they produce content for us. We partner with the Mexican national soccer team. They're producing content for us. And this is great opportunities where it's pushed out to both their owned and shared channels as well as ours. So we're amplifying the reach that we get with all of this content. So long story short, it's probably like six agencies, one internal person who coordinates all of that, and obviously the brand managers and so forth have oversight over that. And then on the flip side of that, we are do everything in-house mostly. So we have a large creative group that will produce tons and tons and tons of assets for, assets for us. And we do have our product uh, managers. We do have our social media managers. And every now and then, our social media managers will go out and work with agencies. But really, we're able to quickly produce, but we're also able to quickly reproduce. We're able to quickly, quickly able to tweak. So... It allows us to get a lot of content out there for our ladies to share out and to use. So Hope, while you've got the mic, um, in one of our conversations, you had a really interesting, uh, we had a very interesting conversation around how you structure your teams. And I heard someone else talking about that at lunch as well. Um, so can you guys talk a little bit about how you structure your teams for success uh, and um, how, you, how you organize and structure your teams for success and how you maximize their value? Sure. So what we spoke about was as we start in the implementation, as we start executing upon something, what we've done is we've used my team as kind of the project manager or the leader. And what they will do is 
they will go out and they'll source out the stakeholders and bring them all together. And, and it's just going to depend on what we're executing upon. Perfect example, right now we're truly, really trying to move the needle in voice. What does voice mean for Mary Kay and what does that mean for us in the digital marketing world? So we're, we're in the process of going out into the company and finding the right people to bring in together. Once we have them in, they become kind of like our project team, our task force. And they are responsible for that key area of the project. And so my team is just kind of used as that person to keep the things going, to make sure everybody's on task, to make sure that if we need to pivot, they're aware of when do we need to pivot and where do we need to pivot to. Anyone else have any insight? So for my team, I think I mentioned before, we have an account-based marketing manager and that title does not do her justice because she does so much more than that. But all of our campaigns basically funnel through her. So when all of our product marketing managers are trying to run a campaign, they have to go through Brittany. Um, and what that's enabled us on the corporate marketing side to do is to only have to deal with one person, which is awesome. And so she's doing a, a, a almost as good of a job as I would, you know, from brand management perspective of catching that stuff before it gets to me and making sure that, you know, we're, we're getting stuff through that funnel and we're not having a million different people that are trying to crisscross, you know, across the organization and trying to, you know, get things done in kind of a quagmire of a pattern. Um, John, we were talking a little bit about budgets and how you manage budgets, and you were you had mentioned to me uh, you talked about budget values. So can you speak to, and then I'll open it up to the panel about um, how this if how your digital budgets are changing, larger, smaller, and how you manage that? Uh, sure. So with with us, the budgets are becoming more about efficiency. Obviously, that's. Uh, the most important thing. And so what we do is we, we look at the end unit, the commodity, the vehicle, right? And so we look at customer acquisition, how much does it cost to get that specific consumer into whether it's a $75,000 vehicle or a $20,000 vehicle. So the budgeting and where we target them, it's gonna, be, it's gonna vary based on that. And so uh, for us, we kind of define these beforehand, you know, what we're gonna spend on these specific units, whether they're uh, domestic or import. And from that point, we can kind of reverse engineer from various platforms as to where is this individual, uh, who, who is this individual, and having that empathy behind not trying to sell the commodity, but basically selling uh, you know, the, the feelers behind it and, and targeting those guys. So you know, understanding a retired firefighter might have different, um, uh, like, I guess, different values that he's going to have in this messaging strategy. So we try to break it up as much as we can. Uh, targeting these individuals, and then from there, that's kind of how we justify which budget we want to focus on and having how, uh, how much impact we want to have behind that. So there's a lot of thought behind it. Um, and so for us, that's kind of how we justify our, our spend is based on the commodity and who we're going after and what platform and efficiency, of course. So for me, two quick thoughts on this. As a CPG marketing person, I am able to do a marketing mix analysis with our Nielsen data to understand the ROI of any marketing tactic that's really big enough to show up within the analysis, right? So not every little thing we do, those talking pins on Pinterest don't have a big enough investment behind them to understand the ROI on that. But for our bigger tactics, we're certainly able to understand the ROI and even though you'll hear a lot of this TV is dead kind of talk, our highest ROI still remains TV because we are a transactional mass purchase, right? We're trying to get people to buy sour cream more frequently than the 32 days that they're currently cycling on sour cream. So, but for me, the definition of TV is changing. It's video but it's video that's also online. So it is full episode players, it's pre-roll, it's places where I'm still able to get my 15, my 30, or sometimes my six second bumper in front of people and they're engaging with it the same way they would be if they're watching Grey's Anatomy on channel seven, right? They're still engaging with it in the same way. And so that online video falls under digital in a lot of people's minds, but I lump together video as sort of all things TV because it's still the same sort of six, 15 or 30 seconds that I'm putting together. So I don't count that as digital, although that is very high performing and is 
we continue to have cord cutters and cord nevers, that part of my budget will continue to grow while my regular linear TV budget will continue to decrease. I myself just cut the cord about a week ago, so I'm new. If you have tips for me, see me afterwards. Um, yeah. Uh, and then the other piece of budgeting is, um, uh, the, again, the the fraud piece that has me nervous, right? So you hear about P&G, who's like, we're going all in on digital, and they moved everything from TV over to digital, and then they went, holy cow, you can't even spend this amount of money in digital because there's not that many real people available and there's a ton of fraud. And so they really pulled back. And for me, I work very, very closely with my media agency to make sure that all of the checks and balances that we can put in place to make sure that these are real people are trying to be in place. And so I don't know that anyone has really cracked that code. I think that's something that we'll be continuing to work on. But until we have a better understanding of what that is and how I can be guaranteed I'm reaching re real people, I'm, you're not going to see me going with a huge shift all into digital until I understand that better. So for my company, I think one of the uh, biggest pitfalls we've run into with budgeting for digital is that it's kind of a shiny red ball for the executive leadership. Um, I think those of them that have been exposed to traditional media buying in the past you know, and, and saw how expensive that can be, they see digital marketing and they see how cheap it is in the grand scheme of things and they think, well, we're just going to throw a ton of money at it and that's like the, the worst thing that you can possibly do is just throw a ton of money at it and just expect it you know, to produce for you. So for us, because we're doing account-based marketing, you know, we have to plan each of those campaigns and you know, the strategies that we're doing each year for each of those accounts. And that was really hard initially to back into those numbers. You know, we're dealing with multi-million dollar contracts that are signed every two to three years. So how do you determine how much to spend since they're not at the point of sale, you know, when they're clicking an ad and they're getting onto your site and they're getting some information, they're filling out a form. So that took some time. It took a lot of uh, gathering data over a number of years for us to have enough data to really you know, get a good guesstimate and forecast going forward of what that's really going to take for us to do what we need to do every year. Okay. At Mary Kay, we've really focused and refocused around, right now in the beauty sector, tools are real big. So a lot of money has been funneled into what can we do in the area for our ladies to implement something like that. And so we've looked at, uh, you know, like skin analysis, foundation matching, mobile has been a, a real big area. But to your point, yes, it is a shiny ball. The first time we took something in to demo to the executive team, uh, they were like little kids just smiling. And the president's, I want that, I want that. And we're like, okay, we understand you want that, but hang on a sec, Let, let's think this through so that we approach it correctly. So I would say around the budgeting, we've really been looking at uh, mobile, we've been looking at um, tools base, what can we do there for our ladies, and then as I had mentioned before, voice. Um, not so much Alexa, but what can we do on the mobile device for our ladies, not only to help them in running their business, but also to help them in working with their customers and getting their message out. Um, the frictionless buying, that's been a big area we've been focusing in also. You know, Amazon has the one click, everybody's been chasing the things Amazon is doing well. What can we do to take it to the next level for our ladies and their customers. Things like, uh, can they share out a impact video that they're talking about a look that they've created or they're sharing out a look, a spring look that we are offering and now the customer can just hit a button and purchase the look right away, right onto their personal website. They can shop and all they have to do is enter their credit card information. So I want to follow up on that, the, the shiny ball concept and the, and the, um, and the, the Procter & Gamble point is, I think, well taken in that, you know, they, they went all in and then they went, oh, wait, maybe this isn't great. So how do you know when to pivot? How do you know when to say, this isn't working, we're not getting value for this, and how, and how, do, you, how do you relay that information to your stakeholders? or demonstrate that to your stakeholders. Yeah, for me, and I don't know that this is the right approach, this is my approach, and that is I try to do test and learn where possible. So the toddler campaign I was talking about, we started that a year or two ago with a small $250,000 investment, maybe 300, I can't remember, uh, and, and wanted to test like how successful that was. And every year we've grown it bigger and bigger and found new ways to be involved with that. So we're up to a $500,000 or $600,000 investment and these sorts of things. And an important point, if you don't already know this, depending on what your level of media investment is, 
the partner is usually willing to throw in some kind of free research, some brand equity research, some whatever, if the investment is big enough. And so I only found that out by accident when we did one test and it came with a free piece of research and then we did another one and it didn't. And I asked my agency afterwards, how come we didn't get a piece of research? She's like, oh, you didn't meet their minimum threshold for doing research. You need to spend 300,000 or 350 or whatever. So that was an amazing lesson learned for me because that's another question that I ask. Is there a threshold that I need to reach in order to get a free piece of uh, research afterwards so that I can understand? Uh, they'll reach back out to, their, uh, out to their consumers and say, you know, did you notice this ad? Did you take action of this ad and so forth? And it's self-reported, of course, but at least I'm able to track the effectiveness of that particular ad. So whether or not that is the right approach, what I like about it is it doesn't have me going swinging the pendulum all the way to one side and dumping all of my money in there. I'm still able to invest in other tactics that I know work. And secondly, it allows for selling to senior leadership to say, hey, I'm testing with this amount of money and I had these results. Here's what it looked like and here's next time how I want to grow it by another 10%, 20%, whatever that looks like. One of the areas we've looked at is as we are putting different things out there into the market and to our ladies is really trying to personify that item. So some of the challenges, and it kind of goes back to the reporting question, we really have a hard time coming down to some of the KPIs and some of those benchmarks. We keep, you know, measure everything that you, matters you measure, and they're real big into that, and Nathan really pushes that hard, but sometimes we're unable to come to those benchmarks because some of the tools and, and the things that we provide are so specific to a specific area or a use case. So we really try to come back to personifying that event or that moment or that tool. And then at that point we look, okay, is that going to be successful for what we're personifying? And then if not, well, where do we need to go? We recently went through this when I talked earlier about the beauty tools. We went through that when we first started looking at them because we really started looking at devices and we started looking at, okay, well, what does that mean for our ladies and how are we going to market that and what does that mean for that interaction she's going to ha have with that end consumer who is either her customer, potential team member, or possibly a new customer. And we ended up going down the path of these devices handheld because our China market was headed in that direction and they were just doing, going gangbusters with it. Well, in their market, it was working great. But here in the United States, we started realizing, oh, hang on a sec, devices is maybe not where we need to go. We need to go back to the mobile phone and what devices are they using there. So really personifying that experience has worked well for us to make sure that we stay on the right path. I'm going to um, continue on personification of the campaign itself. So we recently launched the Solace Mammography Every Woman campaign because we really want to, you know, I think when you talk about breast, it, you know, tradition is depicted by media, right? It's a very intimate part of a female body. And so we wanted to curate the conversation where women were allowed to um, really become part of the conversation and become uh, and champion breast health and, and become one with, uh, with that as part of their annual wellness exam. And so we did a big campaign that personified the different type of patients that we serve, um, whether it was a first timer or, um, or, or high risk or a woman with high anxiety around her mammogram. Um, so that was, that, that's one of the campaigns that we're currently testing when we use her versus when we use the technology. So there's a new, we recently launched a new technology where the paddle of the mammogram exam is now curved for the curvature of the breast, which makes the mammogram 93% more comfortable. We were the first in the nation to go live with this technology and uh, we were part of the, uh, the research that designed it. Um, and when we go with the technology, is it more clinical and is there an, atta an attachment to wanting to w get your mammogram because it's more comfortable versus when we go with just our traditional value proposition of why Solis, why better mammogram at Solis. Um, so there's a lot of testing around that that defines where I, I apply my budget and, and, and through that I, I'm able to convert higher. Um. Going back earlier when we were talking about, you know, shiny red ball and how to mitigate that, um, and my CTO will be so proud of this. We just went through a huge um, agile product strategy uh, transformation within our organization. So pretty much every department in the company is using agile in some form or fashion. Um, our digital agency, Mojo, which is based here in Irving, um, we were already doing agile. Um, we were on a monthly cadence. 
It enables us to fail fast if we need to and really understand quickly what's been going on um, with our digital marketing efforts. And if you're not doing some sort of, of agile, you, you should be. Um, I think it's really important to get on one of those cadences, whether that's biweekly or monthly or quarterly, where you're really sitting down evaluating, is this working? Okay, it's not working. We need to quickly build something new, see if it's gonna work. Okay, that's not working, and just keep going until you get that sweet spot. Does anybody else have any insights on Agile? I know it's kind of a hot topic right now. Okay. So let's, I want to I wanna follow up on the shiny red ball um, because I know, um, having sat on the other side of the fence, that um, when, you're, when your stakeholders see that shiny red ball and they create... A, a number of unrealistic expectations around what the ball is going to bring. Like, ooh, social media. It's so cheap. It should work. How do you manage that? How do you manage your expectations around things like that? So for us, it's been difficult, to, and in social media in particular, to manage expectations. Um, we have an audience that is pretty much only engaged on LinkedIn. We have an employer base that's heavily engaged on Facebook, and we, and we do have some consumers that we touch that we engage with on there. But Twitter for us is abysmal. And we have a group of executives for a while that kept trying to hammer home this idea that they wanted to build our Twitter presence, wanted to build our Twitter presence. We just kept going back to them and kept saying, we can continue to invest time and money in this, but at the end of the day, if our audience does not use Twitter and does not want to engage on Twitter, you know, that's, that's really hard for us to, to try to move the needle on it. So we've scaled back, we've beefed up our LinkedIn efforts. We still have to tweet, you know, because we don't want people to land on our Twitter page and, and not see a regular cadence of content that's getting pushed out. But the expectation has finally been set after showing them the data, which is really the only way to get everybody to understand you know, what's going on. Um, I think everybody finally started to realize that LinkedIn was where we needed to be. That was where we got the most clicks. We have an above average engagement rate on LinkedIn, um, which I'm very proud of my communications manager for pulling off. Um, but Twitter is just something that we've had to kind of just accept the fact that we will continue to push out tweets. We're not going to be overly concerned, you know, with the engagement rate that we're getting on there, but it's a necessary evil for us. Okay. Anybody else? Um, for automotive, it's such a fragmented journey for the consumer. So the consumer's going to the website, they're going to Facebook, we're retargeting them in, you know, on YouTube, uh, within Facebook, then, you know, they see an ad in Facebook, they don't engage with it, but they go to Google and then they type out, you know, what is this? And so with this fragmented journey, a lot of it for us is having to figure out, okay, where do we put the right message at the right time? And so kind of back to your question with Agile, we have used Agile in, in terms of, you know, what, what, what's the right message for this individual and trying to personify that and, and feel on those emotional feelers and not so much the commodity. And so uh, for, for, for us, we find that, you know, whenever the, the tier one commercials come out on TV, uh, for a create or for a really nice car, most most consumers are going to pick up their phone and they're going to go search. So it's within there that we try to align our uh, Google budget uh, to date to, to day part around whenever Tier One is running these commercials within our market. And so these are little ways that we can kind of, you know, I guess not cheat the system, but just utilize what's available to us. And so those are ways that we find that we can kind of have some kind of impact uh, within what we're trying to do with uh, the digital digital budgeting. Great. Thank you. So we've got about 15 minutes. Um, I know Brad indicated this is a very uh, passionate topic that he is interested in and indicated you guys are all interested in that as well. So I think we'll, at this point we'll open it up to the floor. Before we do that. Before we do that. So get your questions ready. But in the meantime, grab your phones and text AMADFW to 444-222. That will get you entered into the door prizes for today, which is, I know is why you're all here anyway, right? I mean, the topic is cool and all, but door prizes. Um, AMADFW, actually, that should all be one word, I believe. Jeannie, are you? Oh, there you yeah, it, it looks like there's a space. Uh, should it be AMADFW all in word to 444222? 
That will get you entered into the door prizes, which we'll process while we're answering questions now. Who has a question? Right up here in front. I'd like to fund the panel's uh, insights on native advertising, how they're using it, uh, if they're using it at all, and have you experimented with using it in different geographies based upon, you know, I know everybody here has different footprints, geographical footprints for their business, but if you could comment on your native experience, we'd appreciate it. Okay, so this is not going to be a popular opinion probably, but I hate native. Uh, I hate banner ads and I hate native and I refuse to do either of those things because as a consumer, I hate them. At, for banner ads, I ignore them. We all have blinders on to those things and I think a click-through rate of 0.14% is not something to pat yourself on the back about. And, you know, native, I'm scrolling through my phone trying to read a blog and something pops up in the middle. It's like, look, I'm just trying to read an article. I don't want your junky advertisement while I'm doing it. And I know for me personally, when I see a brand pop up there, sometimes I recognize it, sometimes I don't. But if I do recognize it, I go, that's a brand I don't like anymore because they're disrupting my mobile experience, which is very personal to me. And so as a result, as a brand, we will not do native or banner display, period. I 100% agree with that. Funny that you say that. So that is why I go back to what I said earlier, which is I only focus my investment on social and on Google AdWords. I do not believe in any programmatic native or banners. They drive me nuts and I don't want to correlate my brand to something that disrupts their journey on their personal experience with whatever they're doing at that moment in time. Uh, as it comes to regional marketing, I um, so we're in uh, nine states, and I'm very um, the creative that I expose. You know, what, the creative that I expose my consumers in Philadelphia is very different than the one that I ex, you know that I use for Texas. Um, when I first launched the Every Woman campaign, we the the the, the filming was done here in Dallas. And a lot of the women that uh, were exceptional uh, power women that spoke beautifully and advocated for the brand uh, very adequately, but they had an accent. Um, and when I went to, you know, then we launched Philadelphia and Chicago this year, um, and the the assets of that campaign were an uncomfortable experience for those markets. And so now this year, I've flown in women from the East Coast and the West Coast um, to make sure that. There, you know, there was diversity from a ethnographic point of view, but there wasn't diversity from a you know, representation of every woman across the regions of the United States. So, yeah. Um, I think it's a bit different for our industry. Um, as much as yes, they are annoying in your personal, you know, journey uh, for consumers. It's a different industry, guys. Like oh, we're targeting folks who are looking to get a great deal on a vehicle. So. When we serve up a VIN-specific vehicle that you were looking at on our website earlier in the day, that might interest you and that might spark and hijack your interest to go back to the site. And so we utilize these banners very carefully, right? So we only, we only focus on specific behaviors of that consumer and what they're doing to then serve them up that ad again. So you have to be pretty low funnel and it has to create some kind of impulse, but we're not necessarily serving you up another commodity, we're serving you up why buys behind it. So it's a more brand specific, why you should do business with us, why you should go out of your way. And so when we change the conversation and the narrative, we get more engagement. But when we just serve up more product, it, it's annoying. So it's just being mindful and trying that, you know, a, B kind of creative of, you know, we're going to put a commodity here and then we're going to put a different message brand, uh, a brand message behind why you should do business with us. So it does work. And, it, and sometimes it doesn't work. But again, that's digital marketing, uh, so iteration. I think the word impulse was key. Absolutely. For that specific channel within the digital ecosystem, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the impulse of like, I don't want to miss. It's the impulse of just, you don't want to miss out on a deal. And you know, when you're trying to buy a vehicle, you, you want to get the best vehicle at the best cost for your budget. And, and that's what that looks like. And so that's how we try to stay relevant. All right, who else has a question? Hands. Oh, here we go. At least you guys are easy to get to. 
Um, my question's for Hope. So what are some things that you guys are doing to like train and empower your frontline, your consultants in the digital space? Uh, definitely social sharing. So we definitely are empowering them to be able to share out to their Facebook pages for their businesses because luckily we have the, these million women that are marketing our company. So that, that's a big area, big push. Um, but also on the flip side, we're really focusing, like I talked about earlier, on mobile because as our ladies are out there and as they're conducting parties, as they're team building, as they're selling, we don't want them ever to pull out a piece of paper. So we want them, everything we want them to be talking about and doing, we want them to be driving their customers to a, a digital tool in some way, shape, or form. So that's been a lot of our push. Uh, over the next year, as I talked about voice a little bit, we're going to be really looking at what can we do in that area so that we can empower our ladies and really elevate their digital image. But I'd say probably the social area is the biggest area where we're putting a lot of our, our money and our time. What do you read or watch or research just to keep up with trends in the digital space? I attended the Consumer Electronics Show earlier this year, and I would say that was an event that really helped to help frame up our digital strategy. We had uh, launched a new digital strategy last year to our executive team, and in attending that event, that really helped to just confirm where we're at today, where do we need to be in the next five years. That answered a lot of our questions around what is happening, what are some of those platforms that are coming, what are some of those areas, like around 5G, uh, around um, voice, around uh, self-driving cars, around car automation. What's happening there so that we can ensure that we're looking at that and staying on target to be where we need to be? Hello, um, I wanted to speak on how can you, all the way from the CEO level, all the way to you know being a communications manager, have one single voice when you're implementing these campaigns? Uh, for us, what we do is something called brand identity guidelines, or BIG, and it is a very thorough, very detailed document that is, I don't remember, it's 250 pages long, maybe, I don't know, it's ridiculously long, that has every detail you could possibly imagine of our brand, including our personality, our positioning, and so forth, but how you can treat the flower logo, and how many petals need to be shown at every time, at what angle, and which fonts you can use, and the distance between the fonts, and all of these sorts of things, and so I mentioned we have so many agencies that we use, the agencies have been well-versed and docu indo indoctrinated into the brand identity guidelines. So we're at the point now where they don't even, they don't miss, right? They're so spot into what those brand identity guidelines are that it fits with what we're looking on. So a couple years ago when we first started, there was a lot more back and forth, right? But as we've got them set and solid into the brand identity guidelines, it becomes very consistent throughout. Getting the brand identity guidelines blessed throughout the organization probably took longer than it takes to get campaigns through now because we wanted to be very thorough and specific. That being said, we never printed the document. It is online only, and that is because it is intended to be a living, breathing document. The, the brand can and will change over the course of time, and so we reserve the right to change it at any time that we see fit. I think just having your brand guidelines uh, as basic as this sounds on your company internet, you'd be amazed how many companies don't do that. Um, it should be out there for everybody and anybody in the organization. A lot of people, a lot of you know, brand directors are very nervous about their brand guidelines you know, being out and about in the organization. Don't do that. It's okay for everybody to have your brand guidelines, um, and it's important that you provide some brand training for them. If you have a webinar within your organization, record it put it out on the internet, let them watch it again, and you know, partner with HR to do some brand training when you're onboarding people. It's really important for them to understand from the beginning when they start with your organization um, you know, what your brand is. You know, it's not just about the logo you know, and, and the graphic guidelines and everything. There's a lot more culturally. You know, there's, a, there's a voice that you want them to understand of how we talk about our company and our space. I think to an extent of that I agree with, you know, we, we also have our, our brand guidebook online and we have it as part of the module one of our orientation. Um, what 
for our company, allowing everybody to understand who the different personas are. So we've integrated them inside of the brand guidebook to just make sure that they understand what our position is in mammography from the point of view of the, of the female herself, of the referring physician and the joint venture hospital partner. And so it's important that as an organization, we holistically understand how it lives within the different frameworks of mind that lives within the different customers. And so that's part of that book. Um, and it's been important for the the day-to-day -day team members that live within the centers to know who she is and how she's living and breathing the brand uh, from her point of view. Any other questions? Oh. Ah, so easy in the front row. Just following up on the brand guidelines, I'm wondering, and probably Mary Kay is, is um, the most um, the company that uses the most, but do you have social media guidelines for your employees? And that, what does that look like? I, I don't see that all the time, and I'm actually working on something where I'm at, but where you're in a company where your employees are brand ambassadors, and where, that's where you're getting a lot of your information out. Um, you know, that that's a, I, I haven't seen too many of those around, and I've been looking for examples and couldn't, didn't run into, you know, brand guidelines, you're gonna run into them everywhere, but most guidelines I look at do not have internal social media guidelines. You know, what do's and don'ts and which channels and, you know, when your employees are reposting your things all the time. Just wondering if anybody's come across that. Great question. Uh, I'm a huge Facebook Facebook practitioner, and so that's a great question because we would manage 160 plus dealerships who want to have access to the Facebook channel, but we're Lithia, and it's one you know, one umbrella over all these other dealerships that were bought out, you know, mom and pop, you know, just dealer groups, things like that. And so, I think the the initial strategy has to start with is how are we utilizing the platform, and what's the purpose of it. And so when you kind of define that, then you kind of have an understanding of what is, your, what is the value you're giving to that end user. And you know, uh, depending on all the different ad formats that Facebook offers, it's like how do we utilize and how do we leverage a specific ad format where that customer is or where they're at in the funnel. And so I think from that standpoint, that's how I was able to define, okay, these ad formats are specifically for these tactics. And by kind of keeping it that way and, and defining it that way, it allowed for having some kind of foundation, but yet not hijacking creativity and not being able to utilize those ad formats in a creative manner. So then you also have to have the checks and balances, like send it before we post it and that approach. And so I think it's internally whatever you decide and whatever works for your organization and how you can scale up or scale down with that. So we do a lot of employee advocacy within Solus Mammography just because we really want to ensure that they're embedded. Um, we're 87% woman-led organization, and we want them to be part of the Every Woman conversation, and then we want them to um, curate the story themselves. And so the, the structure that we put around that is, uh, is by campaign. So we, you know, we don't put a social guideline around how to speak within that space. But every, you know, we have uh, Women's Health Month in May. We had um, uh, International Women's Day, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, et cetera. We, we, we create constructs around what that looks like and what we want them to talk about and what we think will inspire them to join for each individual campaign and by channel. We communicate that, so, I mean, it's part of the structure of communication within our company. We have an operations meeting every month, so I, I do that, and I have a bi-weekly with the BPs of ops, so we continue to embed the, the, the need for engagement. We send out emails, and then recently we started to do uh, a LinkedIn ads that promote the campaign to the employees to remind them to join across all other um, social channels. Just targeted to the employees? Yeah. And then we send out play guides, we send it to their centers, and I put um, little contests. So for Women's Health Month, will be um, whichever center as a team co-create the most content, they'll win a spa at the center. So they'll have a mini spa day within the center itself. Yeah. How about a round of applause for our great panelists and moderators? <laughs>